much for that wonderful introduction, Hung Yi. And absolutely, I am delighted to be here uh, with um, all of you on this webinar. Um, I'm not going to refer to the slides now because Amy and Lee Lee will be taking us through the Start Path slides. I will make some opening remarks about uh, MasterCard and our view of payments around the world. And you've given, given me a wonderful introduction for that by sharing some of the statistics that are here in the UK. So as you rightly pointed out, MasterCard is one of the biggest um, networks in the world and we're one of the oldest fintechs. Um, and we began building our digital network so many years ago. And one of the great strengths of it is that it is both physical and digital. So your comment about feeling a little vulnerable if you're running out of charge on your telephone, I think you're not alone in that space. <laughs> At some parts of the world, in fact, many parts of the world, the telephone networks um, are still not reaching everyone they need to reach. Um, and, uh, and often we're relying on batteries that don't have a perpetual life. Um, what I would say about being in a strong company that has what could be described as a fortress balance sheet, this is the type of thing that you need to survive during things such as a global pandemic. Um, and it's allowed us to continue our business moving more and more into the digital space because the pandemic is certainly an accelerator into the virtual world, as we can see here from this Zoom call. If we think about um, our business, we actually think about what's happening around the world in terms of what's happening to people, what's happening in the markets, and what's happening in society at large. And we think about our business strategy in this way too. If I, if I look at people, then actually treating people with decency, being very clear how you want to run the business during the pandemic, uh, making sure that everyone is treated equally is very important. Uh, we went one step further and said, that we would not have anyone leaving the company during COVID-19 being made redundant. So we would keep our, all of our workforce. There would be no one that was made redundant because of the pandemic through this year. And we also said that people could make their own decision about when they can come back into work if our offices are open. Uh, it's a personal decision whether you continue to work remotely or whether you do a combination of being in the office and working remotely or being in the office for a longer time. Um, in addition to that, we also rolled out a number of things around the world that created a much more level playing field between men and women. For example, we, rolled, we are rolling out on a global basis paternity leave and maternity leave, which is a minimum of four months in every country in the world. Um, and I'm very excited about this because I think the paternity leave helps women very much because it levels the playing field and it also makes it clear that it's important for men to be supporting their families and that the culture of our company actually promotes that. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing on the people front. If I look at what's happening in the market and Hung Yi, you, you brought this forward, uh, we are seeing an acceleration from cash to electronic everywhere in the world. In fact, on a global basis, 70% of consumers are telling us that they're shifting to digital payments. Um, and that varies according to geography. Um, it's actually just below 50% in Asia Pacific are moving cashless, whereas um, it's going faster in places such as Europe, 
where even in Europe, 64% of people are telling us that their prefer preferred way to pay is actually contactless. They don't want to touch the machines. They just want to be able to tap their card or put their telephone across the machine, as you've described, um, in order to make a payment. And because of that, we have actually been raising limits in about 40 different countries in the world to make this possible. For example, the limit has gone up to something like um, 200 Aussie dollars in Australia um, to go contactless. And for that, you can buy a very nice basket of groceries and other things that you might choose to buy. Of course, um, in this time of virt the virtual world, many of us are using e-commerce and no more so than in America. Our statistics show that in May, year over year, 93% growth in transactions of e-commerce. And in Britain, now one third of all transactions are actually e-commerce. Um, clearly because we're in a situation where we're ordering everything online during this pandemic, apart from perhaps shopping in some of our local stores for things like groceries and other essential items. Now, of course, with this comes um, more cyber risk, more fraud, um, and so therefore the investment in systems to detect this, and particularly artificial intelligence systems, um, is increasing over time. Uh, in MasterCard, we've been buying artificial intelligence companies. We bought Briterian on the west coast of America. We bought new data. We bought the payments infrastructure of Britain, which is called Vocalink, which has amazing AI that can track payments from one bank to another. And this infrastructure is being rolled out in Thailand, in Singapore, in Sweden, at the New York Clearing House, and we're building hubs in Latin America and in the Middle East and Africa and across Southeast Asia that allow us to bring the infrastructure even further to different parts of the world. But also we're recognizing, as you have great experience, uh, those of you who are in China with Alibaba, we're recognizing the need for more small and medium-sized businesses to be able to access markets online. And so for those businesses, we are offering them free cyber security services for several months in order to help them be able to manage their business, bring themselves up online and get the kind of protection they need and teach them what they need to think about to be aware of going forward. The other thing that we're doing is we're working with many governments around the world to give them insights as they try to open up their countries post pandemic. The type of insights that we have are based on big data and they can show us things such as um, whether shops are open or they're closed. They can show us what the transaction flow is like. So it gives you a feeling of how many people are entering and transacting in the shops. And that of course gives you a feeling of how crowded an area is or how quiet an area is. And that's very important as you're trying to still maintain social distancing, but of course open up your economy. And the good news about that is that it's not personal data, it's big data, data that the government can act on from an economic point of view without actually invading anyone's privacy. The final area that I will uh, mention uh, before handing over to Amy and Lee Lee to tell you about our wonderful Start Path program is what we do for society. In 2015, uh, we made a pledge to the World Bank that we would include an extra half a billion people into the financial system. I'm so pleased to tell you that we actually attained those numbers and now we've stretched that target to one billion. 
And in order to do this, we're doing many different projects across many different countries in the world, uh, using all sorts of different techniques and partnerships to bring people into the financial system. And governments are very important here because governments are a funding source for, for most of their people. They pay benefits, they pay pensions, they pay child allowance, um, and, um, and their, their reach is very deep into their populations, whether you're in China or you're in South Africa or you're in Peru. Um, and so we, we partner a lot with governments on these programs. Um, the other thing that we're doing is um, we believe in data for good and we believe in partnering um, in areas that are not necessarily linked to payments. And one of the areas that we're working with is the Gates Foundation on a therapeutic accelerator to actually get medicines to help with the pandemic. Um, now, the other thing that we're working on is something that we call Health Pass, which is um, we believe as you move from country to country in the future, it, it may be necessary to have something digital which can describe the state of your health. Perhaps if a vaccine arrives, it could show that you had been vaccinated. If a vaccine doesn't arrive, then it could show that you had tested for antibodies or it could show that you had recently received a COVID test and were clear. So all of these things I think will be needed in the future and they'll be needed on a global basis because obviously to get the world's economy working well again, we want to be able to travel from country to country in a safe and um, in an effective way. So we are thinking of all of these things and the way that our global network could actually help in opening up the world and allowing everyone to get on with their lives in a safe, secure and private way. And the last thing I'll say is we particularly think this is important to small and medium businesses because these are the businesses that a lot of economies depend on. And these are the businesses that often don't have cash to survive crises. So we put together um, a war chest of basically $250 million to spend in this area in the next few years. We set ourselves a goal of reaching the next 50 million um, small and medium sized businesses. And the great news that I feel with our gender initiatives is we said, we won't just go after a third of these to be run by women, which might be the natural level, but we're actually going to help women SMEs uh, because we're going to make sure that 25 million of that 50 million goes to women founded and women run country companies because women are suffering quite a lot during this pandemic. They're on the front lines of the medical side of things. Um, they are, uh, data is showing they're losing their jobs faster than men and it can be harder for them to reinstate themselves as the recovery comes because many women do not receive funding at the same level as men on a global basis. So at MasterCard we're thinking of this and trying to change the world as we come through this pandemic. And on that I'd love to hand over to my colleagues who happen to be women, <laughs> Amy and Lily, who will talk to us about our Star Path programme. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. And hello, everybody on this webinar. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. My name is Amy Neal, and I'm responsible for MasterCard's Global FinTech Engagement Programme, which is a programme that we call Start Path. And I'll just wait for the slides to come up because what I'm excited to do with you today is share a little bit about how MasterCard works with emerging fintech. But also, given the topic for today's webinar, I'd like to share some examples of what we've seen from fintech leaders during this time of crisis. So if we can move on to the first slide. I'll start by talking a little bit about the context in which we operate. So if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, Emmy, 
uh, maybe uh, a little bit technical issue, but uh, maybe you can continue uh, your talk and uh, uh, we will adjust for that. Certainly, absolutely, Hungi, no problem. So in terms of the context for, for why we think about fintech and em particularly emerging fintech at MasterCard, one of the things that we recognize as being really important to acknowledge is that venture capital dollars into fintech continues to flow. So 2019 saw a peak year for VC dollars in fintech with 40 billion going into fintech ventures right across the globe. And while there may have been some anticipation that that number was going to collapse uh, in, in response to the crisis, actually what we're seeing over the past four months is that that figure is holding up. So in Q1 this year, we saw $10 billion going into venture-backed fintech companies. We saw the figures for April and May were roughly comparable to 2019 in terms of numbers of deals, even though the value of those deals was just marginally lower. So capital continues to flow. The second thing when we think about fintech is that partnership is really the big story today. We've talked in the past about the disruption of fintech, but today partnership is leading. There's an exciting and genuinely ripe opportunity for partnerships where early ventures and established entities like MasterCard and some of our more traditional customers can each bring their own uniqueness to the table. And we believe that that partnership imperative will only increase in a post COVID world. We're also recognizing that fintech really isn't just about the new players. So 82% of global financial services providers genuinely expect their collaboration with fintechs to grow as they race to be fast followers of new trends that are emerging across the globe. And the final piece of the context for us is around governments and regulators. They have their parts to play and they're very focused on making sure that they are stimulating startup ecosystems and fintech ecosystems with their, in their companies. So if we move to the next slide. So if we could just go into the next. So in that context, we at MasterCard set up a program that we call Start Off to serve as a front door for emerging fintech companies to engage with both MasterCard, but also our vast network of customers and stakeholders across the globe. We've been running the program for the last five years, and over that time, we've had over 10,000 emerging ventures apply from over 120 countries to participate in the program. Of those 10,000, we've selected 230 companies that we believe to be truly best in class in terms of what they're bringing to the market. And those companies, after they've participated in our six month program, have gone on to raise about $2.7 billion in capital. And that's a figure that we're proud of because it demonstrates that we're picking the winners, but we're also supporting their journey in growth and scale. One thing that's really important for us in running the Start Path program as well is it's not only just about bringing companies through the program, it's also about the ways in which we co create and work together. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll just give you a sense of the types of trends that we've seen in fintech over the last five years and why we think those are important for our world and our ecosystem. So next slide, please, Hung Yi. We'll get there. So the next slide when we get to it, shows us a wheel that represents the different sectors, the different types of company that we've worked with through the program. Um, and those are companies that have applied to us and, and, and areas in which we've responded by selecting those companies. Hang Yi, are we able to get to the slide? So uh, obviously a large majority of the companies that we've brought through the program clearly fall into the fintech space, whether that's pay tech, whether that's more broadly commerce, reg tech, cross-border, digital experiences, lending and banking as a service. These topics for us are really interesting. We've supported neobanks in the space, but we've also supported 
a lot of fintech companies who are instituting a B2B model and working closely with traditional players in order to provide additive services together. But then the rest of this wheel demonstrates the adjacencies to fintech that are increasingly important in the fintech world. So security is huge. Cybersecurity fintechs, companies that are tackling fraud in our payments ecosystems and more broadly, and of course, companies that are thinking about identity, new ways that individuals can identify themselves in order to be authenticated to participate in financial services. We also have companies in the engagement space, so companies that are thinking about data analytics, how to surface insights from large bodies of data that we, that we are able to create through financial services, but also how to take actions upon those insights. And in lots of cases, how to reward people for their behavior and how to provide them with loyalty to the brands with which they're engaging. We also have a number of companies in the inclusion space. So financial inclusion, bringing the underbanked and unbanked, both in terms of individuals and small businesses, bringing those unbanked and underbanked people into financial services by deploying new solutions through fintech to those individuals. And we're really excited to have seen that those types of companies are emerging both in developing markets, but also increasingly in developed markets where we recognize that there are large swathes of the population that remain underbanked or unbanked. We've been very focused on the picks and shovels that sit behind new solutions in financial services, and we call this area efficiency. These are the enabling technologies that are bringing new solutions to market. So novel use cases for blockchain, novel use cases for artificial intelligence, API first solutions and that all important middleware layer that's enabling financial services experiences. And then the final category for us is all around consumer experience. So how does a consumer experience the world of retail, but also the world of the banking, thanks to new technologies in the area of acceptance of payments, in the area of augmented reality, in the area of IoT and wearables. We think a lot with our fintechs about what the branch of the future will look like and what the shop of the future will look like. So I hope that gives you a sense of how we see the world of FinTech. And having heard from Anne's fantastic keynote around how MasterCard thinks about its position from a leadership point of view, what I'd now like to do is share with you some examples of purpose-driven leadership that we've seen from some of our FinTech partners through this time of COVID. And the way that I'd like to do that is by taking you on a trip across the globe. So if we could move on to the next slide, please. So I'm first really excited to tell you about a project which went live in April, directly in response to the impact of COVID. And this was a project that demonstrates what can happen when public, corporate and startup power comes together. The city of Los Angeles reached out to MasterCard to ask for our help to figure out the best approach to raise donations and then disperse and track emergency funding for the poorest and those suffering most in the city. So MasterCard leveraged our existing work in the donation space and collaborated with our FinTech partner, Goodworld, who's also a Startpath company. And this project enabled people within the city of Los Angeles to put their hands in their pockets and support, donate and support their communities who were facing the most serious impacts of COVID-19. What makes Goodworld really interesting and easy to deploy at speed is the way that they've tackled donations by connecting people with charities over social media, enabling them to donate in a completely frictionless manner. Through the solution, the city was able to organize fundraising campaigns and activate social media and SMS channels that Goodworld brought to market. As the donations came in, there was an immediate need to then very quickly disperse those funds to families in need. So MasterCard brought a reloadable prepaid card to bear in order to disperse those funds. And what resonates to me most with this project is that when we reached to our partners to enable this, nobody said no when we were looking to build this program. With the power of the network, the technology and the resources that the city, MasterCard and the FinTech brought together, we were actually able to deploy this solution within eight days. So moving from the US 
let's go to a, a different part of the world, which is also a fintech hotbed, and that's in Latin America, and that's in Brazil. So we'll move to the next slide, please. So from our deep engagement with fintech founders, we know that entrepreneurs start companies because of their desire to lead. Regardless of the problem that they're solving, the desire to build a company in a different way is what drives them to enter into this, the world of startup. And the current time sees fintech leaders really redoubling on the reasons that they started their businesses in the first place, providing value for their customers, removing friction, tackling fraudsters, and ultimately democratizing finance. But in the case of Brazilian company and fintech partner of MasterCard, ID Wall, they saw themselves stepping into a brand new world in response to COVID. So ID Wall has a mission to enable financial services players to onboard new customers at speed, providing a fully frictionless and compliant experience. And this onboarding of new customers is a major pain point for financial institutions across the world. They see huge drop off rates from an interest in a financial product to actual conversion because of the friction of and, and, and regulatory compliance requirements of onboarding. As COVID began, began to hit Brazil, ID Wall realized that their solution for frictionless onboarding had an incredibly valuable use outside of financial services. And so they pivoted their solution to verify doctors. ID Wall started using their technology to check a doctor's credentials and to use their biometrics to confirm their identity. And in this way, the company enabled doctors to connect with patients in a fully compliant manner, which allowed patients to seek medical treatment without putting themselves at risk of contracting the, virus, contracting the virus. And, you know, really the founder could never have envisaged stepping into the medical domain, but because they were agile, because they were mission driven, they were able to pivot to benefit people in new ways. And my final example takes us back to uh, back around the world to India. So if we can move on to the next slide. So as Anne acknowledged, we know that small businesses have really been hit hard by the impact of the, of the pandemic. At MasterCard, we're super excited to have been working with Indian startup Barrett Pay on their phenomenal path to scale over the past 12 to 18 months. This company works with millions of micro entrepreneurs across India, enabling those micro entrepreneurs to accept digital payments. And at the outset of the pandemic, one of the things that Barrett Pay did, which I see time and again in leadership in FinTech, was they doubled down on their customers. They thought about the needs of their customers first, and they introduced new innovations at speed to benefit their merchants. So the first thing that they did was they instituted a search facility for consumers to very quickly find local merchants, order goods, and have them delivered overnight. And the impact for their customer base was that they turned bricks and mortar merchants into delivery services overnight by providing another route of connection between consumers and those micro merchants. They also thought hard about the needs of their shopkeepers, the needs of their micro merchants and the fears that they would be having. So they very quickly introduced overnight voice alerts so that rather than shopkeepers having to touch their phone and run the risk of contracting the virus, they've introduced voice alerts for a shopkeeper to instantly hear confirmation of their payment without having to touch the phone. And then they extended that voice capability to provide a daily sh snapshot for the shopkeeper to really understand their full financial position at that, this uncertain time. So by being there for their customers, by placing their customers at the heart of their solution, this FinTech was really able to follow MasterCard's broad approach of doing well by doing good. They served their customers, but also built their own strong business at the same time. So I hope that that gives you an insight into what we think is interesting from a fintech point of view. The way that MasterCard takes a leadership position in working with emerging players, and then also some examples from across the road, across the world, as to how fintech leaders themselves have been leading through the time of pandemic. And with that, I'll hand back the floor to Hung Yi. Uh, 
Hằng Nhĩ, you, you're on mute. Hằng Nhĩ, you're on mute. Maybe I could, you know, ask a question. A and A, okay? Hello, everybody. Yeah. You know, I'm in Hangzhou, you know, that's where, you know, and you notice that uh, Alibaba and, and Hangzhou are headquartered in Hangzhou. That's where yeah. Chinese investors are I've been to Alibaba's headquarters there. <laughs> The, you know, Amy was talking about saying doing well by doing good. And you have some excellent examples how you were, you know, helping the people in need during the COVID-19 crisis. And obviously from a capital market perspective, you are doing very well. You know, market cost and the market cap is higher than any, any bank in the world. My former employer, J.P. Morgan, probably is the closest, but it's like 290 billion still short of your market cap. So does that mean actually the banking sector is really going, you know, as the dying, dying dinosaur, you know? Is that uh, uh, very clear in a certain extent, you know, and is the COVID-19 accelerating that process as well? Just a quick mm -hmm. question. So are you asking me, Ben, whether um, our market cap's going to continue to accelerate uh, through COVID-19 and beyond? Is that the question? Uh, what I would say is that, you know, from a capital market perspective, certainly you're doing well by doing good. And then yes, you know, all right. Yes, absolutely. Better than, than any, yeah. any, basically. And it, does that indicate a trend that the fintech companies, which you are a leader, and then he's going to take over basically the so-called like dinosaur banking system. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right that companies that uh, are, are interested in social impact and are measuring their social impact as well as their P&L um, and are following a model that, uh, you know, some call altruistic capitalism by the way, um, are actually performing pretty well right now and probably into the future. And I think there's various aspects of this. One is that um, if you think about something like climate change and you talk to the big investors, for example, BlackRock, they're very clear that climate change poses great risks that the capital markets respond to risk and that companies who start to pay real attention to social issues such as climate change are helping manage risk and therefore um, they benefit from that in terms of becoming more valuable to the world both economically and from a social point of view. I think it's absolutely the trend for now and for the future. And uh, are you back? Are you... Yes, so thank you very much for both Anne and Amy, your uh, brilliant uh, presentation on that. I'm sorry for any technical issue uh, cause any uh, inconvenience, but I'm sure all participants are very enjoyed for that. So uh, with that, I also want to turn to Professor Yanagawa uh, as that uh, I'm, I know that Professor Yanagawa, you also did a lot for the FinTech, especially for Japan. And two years ago, you lead the delegation group uh, to China. So uh, we were very much like to get your perspective uh, in terms of uh, how does you see like the issue and uh, also uh, how do we also could respond for those uh, disruptive innovation, especially during the time of crisis. Thank you, thank you very much. My name is Inori Ichi Yanagawa and uh, Yes, uh, two years ago, I visited Hangzhou and uh, it was very, very nice experience for me. And uh, I have a great impression at that time that uh, China is a leading country and uh, Hangzhou is a leading uh, area for fintech and uh, data analysis field. And uh, that impression is still keeping in my mind. And uh, in Japan now, also, through this uh, COVID-19 uh, serious experience, we had to uh, stay at home, uh, work at home, and uh, uh, as other countries, 
we have experienced very high increase of uh, e-commerce and e-payment. Then I, I have uh, recognized that uh, digital payment is uh, very, very important. The importance of digital payment is increasing in Japan and all over the world. So in order to experience, uh, in order to promote the uh, uh, digital payment, so we had to get uh, data and the data analysis uh, to more uh, rich, provide uh, more excellent services for users. So in that sense, that uh, in that period, uh, the China has a great advantage and uh, the, the data analysis of the Chinese companies uh, has a very good experience, it's a very, very good strategy so that uh, we, in Japan, we have to learn from China about this field. Of course, the, the system of uh, the philosophy about privacy is different from country to country. So we, we cannot use the just same strategy as China, but uh, even in Japan, we have to consider about the trade-off between the privacy and the data analysis in order, in order to uh, realize a very good strategy for promoting that uh, data analysis. Uh, just considering seriously about the privacy. So that's uh, uh, my, my great impression in the experiences in China is uh, so very, uh, my basic for this, my in consideration in, in these days. Okay, and so uh, beyond that, would you like to also maybe share your feedback uh, after listening to me and Anne's uh, speech? Yes, and how yes. Maybe you can also incorporate some element and uh, to help our audience to see the issue from different angles. Sure, yes. And uh, I also excited about uh, the, the two presentation about uh, the strategy of MasterCast. And uh, I also very strongly recognize that the MasterCast is a leading company in the world about this FinTech field and uh, data payment field. And I'd like to ask uh, two questions about uh, your presentation. One is the, your global strategy. And uh, as you uh, showed uh, experiences in India or experiences in the United States, and of, of course experiences in the United Kingdom. And, but uh, the, the financial sector, financial industry is the regulation or legal rule about the financial sector is very different from country to country. And the regulation about privacy is different from area to area. So I, I think it's very difficult to uh, use the quite uh, uniform strategy for all over the world. And you have to consider uh, more detailed strategy for each country. And you have to, uh, it seems to me you have to change the the main strategy from country to country. So that how do you, are you managing this kind of a difficult strategy? Uh, so I'd like to know about this. Particularly I'm interested in your policy about uh, Japan. And the second question is uh, really related to the Ben's question, but uh, uh, your services, uh, the relation between your services and uh, uh, global platform companies, just like Alibaba or Tencent or Google or Amazon. In order to consider the kind of global fintech services, you have to consider the, the strategy of the fintech uh, global platform company because there is a kind of uh, your uh, competitors. Or in some cases, they are the, your good partners. I think the combination of uh, complementarity between your service and the global platform companies is important, but I would like to know the detail about uh, your, your opinion about uh, global tech comp uh, platform company, so your strategy about uh, this company. These are two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. And, um, and of course, you're quite right that um, regulators have different rules in different countries, and we have to comply with 
every regulation around the world. So it's a massive undertaking uh, when we work in more than 200 countries globally. Um, now, I mean, clearly, um, because we are a Western-based headquartered com company, then, um, you know, we have some privacy rules and efficacy which we apply on a global basis. And, um, and that forms the basis of what we do with respect to data. We think, by the way, that consumers should be in control of their own data and they should be able to make decisions about how they share that data and they should be protected and they should be facilitated to do it in a safe and secure manner. And this, of course, is not something which um, is um, followed in every country in the world. In fact, the way that China handles data is very different from the way that Europe handles data. Um, but, uh, but we have our own rules about how we choose to operate to protect privacy. Um, and then, um, and then, if, you know, then we layer the local rules on top of this. Um, but our base level could be, say, higher in terms of privacy than a local country's individual rules. So that's kind of one thing. I would say um, absolutely you're right that, um, for example, um, Alibaba and Tencent and um, Amazon and PayPal and, you know, lots of different companies out there um, are in our space and from that point of view um, we might have a competitive relationship but at the same time they are partners of ours you know that they use our rails and our network to affect payments on a global basis so um, so we all live in a world where we actually um, in some senses help each other from a commercial point of view and um, and we're closely following um, what decisions companies are taking in this space and trying to develop our products so that we become a desirable partner rather than a competitor to them. Um, and, um, and obviously when you have companies like Amazon and you have Rakuten and so on, you, you, perhaps the, um, the idea of being a partner is, is, more, um, is more easy to follow, right? because uh, people don't understand, for example, looking at PayPal, that they may actually be piggybacking on top of what MasterCard does, um, or that you know, Alibaba may use us in countries to actually extend their reach. Um, the good thing is that this world is an extremely big place and there is lots of rooms for different players to compete um, and the payment market is still a, pretty fragmented on a global basis. Um, and the thing that's exciting to us in recent years is that we've seen the rise of the digital banks, um, particularly in places like um, Europe, where you have N26 or London, you have Revolut or Monzo or Brazil, where you have New Bank. And I think that these kind of digital banks are now starting to give um, consumers a new experience of banking and are causing traditional banks to digitize. So, so it's creating a lot of activity um, in this area. And at the same time, you have digital currencies coming in um, as people look at something, um, at both governments and, and also people like Facebook looking at digital currencies. So it's a massively shifting and very exciting marketplace. Um, and that's what we enjoy about it. That's why Amy is working with so many fintechs to make sure we're in the blockchain side of things, um, that we're actually working with people developing tools in the marketplace, as well as people developing completely holistic solutions. Amy, I don't know whether you want to say anything. Yeah, so thanks for the question, Professor Yanagawa. One thing that occurs to me in response to your question, I work with a lot of emerging fintech companies and they're often led by tech entrepreneurs who have had experience of scaling tech companies globally. 
And they're often under pressure from their investors to think about the same in the fintech space. One of the things that we try to support those companies to do is recognize that fintech is incredibly different when it comes to global scale. And as you rightly point out, scaling from country to country is a very different challenge than simply localizing. One of the benefits of partnering with a company like MasterCard is our global scale and presence and the ability for us to provide them with expertise and boots on the ground to think about how they do tackle some of those challenges, whether it is the local regulator, the do local data privacy laws or whatever that is. So I think that your question is incredibly pertinent, particularly as it relates to those new entrants as well, whether they are neobanks or whether they are infrastructure players or whatever part of the fintech pie they're addressing. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. So I think uh, maybe here I have a, one question uh, for all of the participants. As you may be aware that uh, just two days ago, that one of the largest uh, fintech company and financial just changed its name and the drop financial of uh, out from its name and the from and financial to and technology. So which means like, so sometimes we talk about the fintech and the tech fin. So from uh, your perspective, how do you see uh, maybe in the next um, decade or uh, how does it really looks like for the financial industry and uh, what kind of the revolution or the innovative disruption is going to tech? Uh, so I think uh, this is the question open to all uh, participants. Maybe for me, I can just uh, share my perspective about this. Uh, I think uh, the change for end financial for end technology probably is an indication that they want to be simpler in terms of regulatory environment. Anything that is, uh, uh, you know, regulated as a financial conglomerate will be more complex from a central bank's perspective. Plus, I think end financial or end technology believes that they are first and foremost is a technology company. They are trying to enable and empower the financial services, make it cheaper and more, say, efficient and effective. So I guess that's probably the primary consideration from what I can see. Okay. Well, it's it's interesting, uh, Hung Yi, because uh, Mastercard made the decision to actually drop our name completely and just go with our logo on a global basis which you might see in the corner of my screen here because when we did um, market tests across most of the countries in the world we found that our logo was instantly recognizable in terms of who we are and what we do and we didn't need the words and we also see ourselves as a technology company but in, in answer to your question about the disruption side uh, I mean, clearly open banking uh, is taking off on a global basis and it's going to be probably massively disruptive because uh, you have the fintechs and the financial institutions playing in that space and opening up, you know, the experience for the consumers. And you can see that um, it will go in many different ways. And, um, and certainly from a generational point of view, you probably have a lot of consumers that are very happy to work with fintech companies rather than traditional banks to get access to some of their financial information. And it will be a question of creating consent networks and the ability to do the correct authentication and um, to be able to identify who's a real third party and who isn't. Um, there are things to solve, but um, it's taking off. And I think it's just going to be very different the other thing that's going to be very different, of course, is the whole advent of 5G, quantum computing, um, and then, you know, uh, and then artificial intelligence, when we've got co quantum computing here, is going to change the world radically. Right. Thank you for that. Amy? So I would say that we have seen an enormous growth in the trend of any business becoming a fintech business. And behind that trend, so anybody who owns the experience of the end consumer, having the ability to build in 
um, financial solutions for that consumer. And behind that, we've seen the rise of players like banking as a service and infrastructure players who really provide that capability so that it is easy for brands to deploy um, financial services. Of course, the infrastructure behind that will remain complex, regulated, and technically difficult to achieve. Um, but I do uh, acknowledge that you know the trend towards any company becoming a fintech company by enabling those sort of financial services features, whether that's payment or whether that's other experiences that come about because of regulations such as open banking. Okay, Professor Yamagawa. Uh, yes. We would very much like to get your perspective because a few days ago I saw the news that uh, Japanese government is considered mm -hmm. to, uh, I mean, like to uh, remove or maybe not use the hanko or the seal for mm -hmm. your financial institution purpose anymore. Because in Japan, that the seal or the hanko even is much more important than your signature or it even more, much more important than your real person. So I think that will be very interesting to get your perspective on that. Yeah, this is a very big step for Japanese government, but uh, it goes too late, I think. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's a very good step, big, big step for changing our regulation to more modernized, uh, more fintech-oriented uh, regulation. Anyway, just I, I like to ask, uh, answer to your question that uh, it seems to me that most of the transaction becomes a kind of the part of the fintech services. So that uh, all services becomes kind of fintech services. In that sense, the most of the behaviors are kind of uh, part of the fintech industry. So in that sense, that uh, we, the, the definition, the category of fintech industry, a category of financial industry might be banished in the future. So that most of the transaction is part of the fintech and part of the technology. And we call some, in, some, in, in the near future, we might call those country, companies uh, technology companies. So that, that's my uh, opinion. Okay, thank you. So with that, Lily, we will also very much like to get your perspective, uh, given that we saw that you work uh, for MasterCard and for uh, the program in uh, particular in Asia Pacific and China uh, region. So it will be really great uh, to have your insight for uh, to and to have your perspective on that. Sure. So um, I have to apologize first because I have to turn off my video all the while because I have a kids running behind a two year old. Um, but what I would say that as a, you know, what I see is there is actually a convergence of the um, omnichannel channel experience. So from a consumer perspective, if I'm looking at um, open banking, I'm also thinking about open banking for the experiences that I have in stores. How can I actually make sure that I have a, you know, um, credentials that I would be able to use across in different, different areas. And to be able to do that, I think there's a lot of synergy to work with um, technology partners, fintechs um, in general. I think a lot of the corporations, the big corporations are also um, acknowledging that and are also expediting their work with fintechs um, to make sure that they, they have a framework to work with them, they have a, a way to work with fintechs. So there's a lot more collaborations that we'll be seeing and I agree with um, um, everyone over here to say that uh, that there's a lot more partnership that will actually create a win-win situation. Um, and I always say one plus one is greater than than two for sure. Right, sure. Thank you very much. So before maybe we close the session, uh, may I also pose another one additional question to all of you? As you know now, the um, China, the Central Bank of China. Uh, is announcing and also working for the central bank digital currency. So I just uh, very interested uh, to get the perspective from um, Anne, Amy, and Lily from the Mastercard perspective. How do you see like the central uh, bank digital currency and how does it may uh, relevant to your business? And of course, uh, I will also lovely to get Ben's uh, and uh, Yanagawa's your perspective, uh, respectively, uh, for China and Japan. So the Chinese um, central bank's not alone in terms of looking at digital currency. Obviously, you've got Sweden out there, 
um, and, and many different countries across the world. And I think the thing to recognize is that this, this is very different from the Bitcoin uh, proposition. Um, the Bitcoin proposition um, has an anonymity. It's not linked to a fiat currency. It operates more like a commodity. Um, whereas a digital currency that's actually owned by a central bank um, is basically digitizing a, a fiat currency. So, um, so we see them very differently. And actually, we're working uh, with a number of um, central banks around the world to talk to them about their ideas on this, how they see it working in their economy, what the pros and cons are, and so on. So we're pretty connected to it from a business perspective. Oh, uh, Amy and the lady. Yeah, and the Start Path team within Mastercard is part of Mastercard Labs, which is our innovation and R and D function for the organisation. And we think about what the future looks like for Mastercard in all of its guises. What might be down the road? What might the future look like? And what might we we be dealing with? And along with, as Anne has mentioned, five G quantum computing central bank digital currencies have the potential to impact on the way that we work and we think about you know what that will look like for us by innovating and by co-creating with other partners that are thinking about that future as well okay. so I, i'm not an expert in this space but specifically in asia pacific we do have a um, digital asset expert sitting in together with me in my office uh, where he actually established a lot of conversations with um, central banks to see how we can actually do a lot more collaborative work together. So um, I, I think there's a lot of um, opportunities in there that we would be, you know, doing further collaborations. So stay tuned for that. Okay. And the Ben? I think, you know, from my perspective, I think the CBDC, or some people call uh, is the DCEP, uh, Digital Currency Electronic Payment, I mean, it's, a, it's almost a natural evolution from the current financial systems. As you, many of you know that uh, China is at the forefront of the fintech revolution and uh, third party payment like WeChat Pay, like Alipay, they have changed the way we, 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 we buy, we shop, we, we consume, you know. And uh, during this COVID-19 crisis and China, thanks to the fintech and the digital infrastructure that we have in place that we were able to use a lot of things that are digital, smart, and intelligent. I was trying to show you a, like a health code card. You know, this is a code card that I can access from Alipay. It shows real time that it's a green card. It helps the government and authorities to tackle the so-called like uh, you know COVID-19, you know, a potential infection cases and so on and so forth. So to a certain extent, CBGC, China is. Technically, probably is ready almost, but I think we're doing some test run and uh, hopefully it will be out and it will help the inclusive money. And it will make it easier, even easier and more efficient for the financial system to serve the real needs of the people. I think, Ben, this is a very good point. And one of the things I would say, going back to what I was mentioning about global travel and so on, is that I think that we need global standards for these things instead of kind of using domestic standards that work inside the country is great if you're just always inside your own country. But once you start moving cross border, things have to be interoperable. Um, and, and that's the next wave of thought really. Uh, and you know, to respond to that, you probably see two banners in my background, you know, the AIF, Academy of Internet Finance, as well as the ZIPs. Zhejiang University International Business School. We are absolutely focused on, you know, global collaboration in terms of, especially in the fintech area. And we'll be very happy to talk to Lili, Lin, and as well as Amy about potentially, for example, the start path, you know, a project, how we might be able to work together. China needs to contribute. And we need to benefit from the global partnership from the X2, like uh, MasterCard as well. Great. Fantastic, I'll be looking forward to. <laughs> <laughs> right, because we work with M Financial quite closely, uh, but maybe it's much more uh, from the uh, Chinese uh, perspective. So it will be really great uh, for us to collaborate um, 
to explore the potential collaboration in the future. So thanks for that. And uh, Professor Yanagawa. Yeah, that's, uh, I completely agree with you that the collaboration of our, so, so our team is very important. And that uh, I, I, we don't know the detail about uh, uh, the CBDC, but uh, surely that it must change our future for change of the field of uh, uh, fintech industry. But I, I think that uh, digital currency do not crowd out the private services, private fintech services. I think the collaboration between the digital currency and uh, private services is important. And uh, we will like to uh, examine the detail of this possibility and uh, we would like to uh, discuss about this possibility. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for all of you, uh, particularly the fascinating uh, remarks and uh, speech from uh, both Anne and Amy, and also the insight from Lily, Ben, and uh, Noriyuki. Thank you very much uh, for that. So uh, with that, um, I really appreciate for all of your participation uh, because given uh, that the FinTech webinar is really like uh, because a few months ago that uh, some of students uh, at our university, they are very anxious uh, for their future and what can they do uh, during the COVID-19. So uh, Ben and I were thinking that uh, how could we contribute as the, reg uh, as the educator. So thank you very much for joining us uh, to make some impact to, to the society. And I think that will be really beneficial for the student and the faculty member and the those uh, general public following us online uh, today. So uh, may I also take this opportunity to make the announcement that uh, the next webinar, uh, we have pleasure uh, to invite Paul Musuke from FSD Africa. And he will share uh, the topic of mobile money in Africa, uh, its genesis, growth and impact on Wednesday. 1st July at 4 p.m. Beijing time. So show you being interested in. Uh, we are very happy to see you again. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And we look, uh, we look forward to see you in person, maybe in Hangzhou or in London. <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Or, or even Tokyo. Oh, yeah. yeah. Please, please come. Please come. Please. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.